High-speed internet could be more accessible in greater Minnesota. And will medical marijuana be available via prescription? We talk to the authors of both proposals in this week's Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Barkey. In this week's program, we delve into four different proposals that could be considered in 2014. We begin with a bill that was introduced last session and is carried forward in 2014, medical marijuana. Governor Mark Dayton has been opposed to the measure, but he says he will give it some thought pending a study on the issue. I really you know, respect the sincerity of, of people on both for and against uh, legalization of uh, marijuana for medical uses. I realize there's just, a, a, at least for me, so many unanswered questions that really have a bearing on how many people are we talking about? How many people you know, can only get the medical benefits that they need from using marijuana versus all the other pharmacological options that are legal and can be prescribed? Uh, What's the cost of setting up these different uh, distribution centers, one in every county, and and then uh, network for you know the growing and, and the control and the sale? How how can they you know very valid concerns of law enforcement that and the experiences of other states that have seen a, a wide proliferation of of use of marijuana in the general public, even uh, with the limitation on medical. California, I mean, I have friends who live in California and just find anybody in the neighborhood who, you know, get a blank medical thing and sign it and get yourself a sash. So, I mean, there, so the cost, the cost and benefit part of it, as well as what are the experiences of other states? Where, you know, 21 states now that have adopted this, uh, where has it gone wrong? Where has it, where has it gone right? Senator Scott Dibble is the chief author in the Senate of the medical marijuana legislation. He's here to talk a little bit about where he's going to go next with this proposal. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Julie. Senator, before we get into what's next, why don't you explain what made you decide to actually champion this piece of legislation? It's been around for quite some time. Yeah, this is an issue that I've been aware of for many, many years. Uh, folks might know that a big part of my early work, uh, my volunteerism and some of my activism and advocacy was around HIV and AIDS issues. And, uh, you know, that's an issue that's been front and center and a you know, major public health concern for Minnesotans since the late 80s. And uh, even as far back as then, we knew that the only way a lot of people living with HIV AIDS could get relief from some of the major symptoms uh, wasn't available to them from any uh, conventional medicine at all. Some of the nausea, some of the wasting, some of the, some of the headaches, you know, a lot of the issues um, was through uh, using marijuana. Unfortunately, folks are forced to break the law if they want to seek even the most modest form of relief that's available through that avenue. And so it's been a, a real focus uh, and a key conversation for a lot of people around a lot of these kind of medical syndromes. Um, and a number of other states have actually taken steps and moved in this direction. And the evidence, the strong medical evidence is mounting that, that this is a good route to take, safe and effective. One of the arguments against this proposal is that it's not very tightly regulated. You've stated publicly that your bill is very tightly written. Do you think it's possible to make it tighter to try to get law enforcement on board with this? Or do you think it's, it's written, the way it yeah. it's written, it will stand? Well, some of, some of the arguments against have stemmed from other states' other states' approach to um, the, the idea, and they haven't been tightly regulated, and that's been unfortunate. California is the poster child where, you know, medical dispensaries kind of cropping up everywhere with very little oversight, very little regulation, sky's the limit, uh, very, very loose uh, monitoring of who can get these prescriptions and, and for what and who's and under what circumstances folks are getting these prescriptions. If someone were to actually read our bill, a lot of the criticism in Minnesota is coming from folks who actually haven't read our proposal. Um, the, the regulations, the circumstances, the prescribing authority, uh, all very, very tightly circumscribed. And uh, you know, folks who can get m marijuana, where it can be dispensed, um, you know, all of the uh, controls are, are very, very tight. Senator, in a December 30th interview with the Associated Press, Governor Mark Dayton encouraged proponents of medical marijuana to collaborate with state law enforcement agencies 
to move forward with any legislation. He said he would sign something that the law enforcement community can support. Do you think it's possible to get law enforcement to support this measure or at least stand down? Uh, well, if any of their public statements as well as their private statements to me uh, in the form of emails are any evidence, I think law enforcement is in kind of a lockstep, knee-jerk position of opposition. They have yet to actually read the bill and what it says. And so they make public statements that are just completely contrary to the actual provisions that we have. They make statements about who can get marijuana and that it's you know, loosely regulated and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and they've said clearly, there's no point of your even bringing the language of the bill to our next meeting because we're opposed and we're going to remain opposed. So I respect the governor's position. Sure, let's go have a good faith conversation, negotiation with law enforcement. They're charged with enforcing the laws and making sure illegal drugs aren't getting out into the larger community. If we could in fact have a good faith conversation and negotiation with public safety, for whatever reason, they're taking a position of absolute opposition with no ability to have any really open conversation about the provisions. And so to that point, Governor Dayton, he traditionally has sided with law enforcement mm -hmm. on this issue. However, very recently at a news conference, he requested that it, he talked about requesting an independent study on its use medically, mm -hmm. as well as the potential implications to increased crime. So this is an independent study. How encouraged are you? Is, is this an encouraging side that, uh, sign that perhaps this is, issue is not dead in the water? Well, um, I think uh, it's an indication that, that he's opening his mind to the evidence, unlike law enforcement, which isn't open to the available evidence. I think we can show a couple of things. One is people are suffering right now, and they shouldn't wait. People have been suffering for a long time, and there are families now with little kids with these really, really serious uh, seizure conditions who are being forced to live out of state. Colorado, Washington State, other places, California, so that, so that their kids can find some relief. And so um, I'm encouraged that he's sensitive to the plight of people who are suffering today. And I'm encouraged that he's thinking about things like evidence of around security and, and uh, staying inside the bounds of the law and the efficacy of, of using medical marijuana. I don't think we need an actual independent study about what goes on inside the borders of Minnesota. There is a ton of evidence that this is a prudent course of action and we want to continue to have that conversation with him. And so moving forward in 2014, have you had conversations with lawmakers? Are you optimistic this can pass? Um, I think if lawmakers knew that the governor was going to sign this bill, we would get it passed overwhelmingly and we could get it to his desk in a matter of weeks. We've passed this bill before on a broadly bipartisan mm -hmm. basis. We got it to Governor Pawlenty's desk. He vetoed it, unfortunately. Uh, he had made some indication at some point that he might not, but he vetoed it. Um, you know, I think that absolutely. And, and uh, if you go out and talk to the public, the public overwhelmingly supports this idea as well. So politically, people stand on very solid ground. The policy is prudent. Um, the, the values that underpin this, that we're providing relief to people who are suffering, um, are very, very strong. Um, we just need some leadership, and, and we can get this done. Okay, Senator Scott Dibble, thank you for sharing your thoughts on your proposal. We appreciate your Great. time. Thanks, Julie. Senator Matt Schmidt joins me to talk a little bit about a tour that he is doing to try to expand access to broadband internet. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Great to be here today. So, Senator, this is an issue that you ran on, and it's close to your heart. And you recently went across the state hosting kind of town style, town hall style hearings on this. So, essentially, what's your message to Minnesotans? Well, above all, this was a listening tour, and we wanted to, to get out to all corners of Minnesota and, and hear stories firsthand about what's working and, and maybe if there are any challenges in our communities, what can be done to address those. Over the last uh, decade, we've had three different governor's task forces on broadband development. We've had a number of great initiatives identified, uh, recommendations, policy recommendations, and, and speed goals put into statute. But aside from that, there's been very little action, and we haven't seen uh, the dial moved too much in Minnesota over the last decade. A lot of need, and in those stories on this broadband tour that we heard, really emphasized the, uh, the call to action for Minnesota to step up and do more at the state level. And so what can be done? What is this call, of call to action? 
Well, that's, that's a great question. I think there's a couple of things that we can focus on this session, and I think this session is the perfect time to have this conversation for two reasons. One, the governor has framed this as the unsession. I can tell you there's probably no better area in state law than telecom law to, to look at throwing out old uh, antiquated you know, statutes and updating uh, to the 21st century. In our telecom law, there's more references to the telegraph than there is to the internet. And this is 2014, folks. This is, you know, you know wildly inadequate. So I think looking at the, the unsession and, and throwing out antiquated telecom laws, rewriting it to the 21st century, that's one important thing we can do. And then secondly, uh, infrastructure session here. You look at the bonding bill, you look at the, the need with roads and bridges, with uh, water and sewer. I think 21st century infrastructure with broadband connectivity is right up there, just as important. And we can, uh, we can do a lot in that realm. Any idea on how much this could cost? Well, that's, that's a question that we were actually talking to some economists about right now, and we hope to have some numbers uh, for, the, for the legislature to consider this session. Uh, it, there's a lot that we can do with a little bit of state involvement. I think public-private partnerships is one thing to focus on. But more than anything else, I think being clear, you know, what is authorized, what cities and counties can do, what kinds of partnerships can emerge, how we can play off our natural strengths with cooperatives. Uh, and I, I have to emphasize the great work that our local providers and our cooperatives have done in Minnesota. The challenge really comes down to basic economics, supply, demand, and the cost of getting this service out to, to you know, uh, into far reaches of the state. I think we've got to think about this in new ways, in how to, to, to leverage the, you know, the, the strengths of our, our providers and our cooperatives, but also bring the state into this. And I think there's a, there's a funding element to this, but there's also a clarity of law uh, aspect that needs to be examined. And to parlay a bit off of that, the federal government is currently asking rural community, communities to develop their own strategic plans and to go to internet providers and explain why it's good business for them to provide some internet access or improve internet right. access. So is this something you're advocating to these communities as well? A lot of folks have been talking about broadband and, and what to do with it and how to improve your, your connectivity. And, and I think that, you know, I, I definitely would encourage communities to have a, a vision for how they would like to leverage broadband and, and, and connectivity for uh, economic growth, for quality of life enhancement. You know, you look at our state economy, we're doing pretty well. But there's a lot of parts of Minnesota that just lack that, that basic access to the Internet. And if you're going to have applications related to you know, telehealth or to distance learning or to e-commerce, it's really important that you have high speeds and reliable access to bandwidth. And if our state's ever going to hit you know, its, its potential in terms of economic growth, we've really got to make sure that that creativity, that entrepreneurial spirit from all corners of the state is leveraged. And I think this, this broadband telecommunications access, that is, that's the great equalizer. You're obviously passionate about this issue. Why is it that you've taken on this challenge. Well, you know, I have a background in it. Uh, I've, you know, been, you know, I've, I've done some uh, s some work on projects in the in the distant past, and I also realize that this is the this is the infrastructure of our day. And uh, just as the Intercontinental Railroad of the uh, 19th century, or the Interstate Highway System of the 20th century, uh, linked people and ideas. That's the, the, the transformative potential of broadband connectivity. And we've done a great job in the last decade, but there's so much more work to be done. And, and I go around and I see other states, you know, uh, setting forth initiatives and, and, and stepping up to the plate. And, and Minnesota has been silent on this topic. You go to conferences, you see more and more states talking about their statewide initiatives for improving uh, broadband connectivity. And you see more and more Minnesotans traveling to these conferences, learning what other states are doing. I think it's high time for the state of Minnesota to step up and, 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 and take a leadership role. So how do you move from essentially being silent to trying to pass legislation in such a short time? Well, I'll tell you what I think. One thing you got to do is go listen to the folks who are talking about this, and that's the local communities around the state of Minnesota. Our recent listening tour included almost 20 communities. There are great ideas out there. Folks know what needs to be done. And so I think listening to the people who've been thinking and talking about this, we also have a, 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 a governor's uh, task force on the topic, and they've identified Identified some, some recommendations for us. Uh, various foundations and philanthropies have been active in this space as well. And I, and I think that we've got a play off of this Office of Broadband Development that we created in 2013. Uh, it's fully functioning. The executive director's been named. And I think this office has great potential in, in galvanizing this effort and bringing the good ideas to, to the fore. Okay. Well, Senator Matt Schmidt, we will, of course, follow this throughout session. We appreciate you coming in Thanks today. Thanks a lot, Julie. State Senator David Osmek held a news conference recently focusing on a legislative auditor report which focused on Governor Mark Dayton's misuse of the state plane. The senator says it, along with payments made to an attorney that were never publicly disclosed, are examples of the governor not being transparent. I have a number of questions for Governor Dayton. Why did you change the pro bono contracts with contract with David Lillyhog for billable services? Why didn't you tell the public or the legislature about this change? Why wasn't the expenditure detailed 
in the MMB report. When you saw that the payment wasn't in the report, I'm sure your staffers looked at it, why didn't they bring that to the attention of someone? If the legislative auditor didn't discover this during a normal audit, would the public or the legislature have ever known about this? In the Minnesota House, members have pre-filed 278 bills for consideration once session gets underway February 25th. One of those is to provide a tax exemption for adoption assistance. Here to discuss that proposal, we have Representative Pat Garofalo. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So Representative Garofalo, let's begin with what is adoption assistance? Many employers in Minnesota have a long tradition of supporting families through adoption assistance. And what this means is a family goes out and adopts, the employer will actually provide assistance, help pay for some of those costs associated with it. And currently under federal tax law, that is not a benefit that is taxed. So in other words, the employer can provide this benefit to the employee, no taxes are paid on it. Unfortunately in Minnesota, because of the actions of the last legislation, last legislature, that is now subject to taxes in Minnesota. So many of the employers in Minnesota who provide this assistance, uh, families who have participated in these programs, are now being hit with a big tax bill because they went out and adopted. In my own district, uh, I have of two families, one in which they adopted twin brothers, and they're being subjected to a state tax. And this is really foolish, foolish policy. Everyone supports adoption. Everyone promotes it. It makes no sense for us to tax it. Well, so you've talked a little bit about the issue. Why do you think it's so important to conform to the federal standards? Uh, for various reasons. Number one is that from a simplicity standpoint, it just doesn't make sense to have people required to have extra costs for accounting or tax attorneys to file for two forms. Standardization really is the easiest thing to do. But second of all is there's a cost to compliance. In addition to the actual higher tax bill that families have to pay for, just having to pay for these services when they really should be able to do it on their own, this is destructive tax policy. Even though the legislature raised taxes by over $2 billion last year, it shouldn't be something that's so complicated that in addition to paying higher taxes, families have to pay for tax attorneys as well. So how much revenue would the state lose if indeed this is repealed? Uh, less than a million dollars. And so the sad thing about this is that right now in the state of Minnesota, what the legislature and the governor have decided is there's plenty of money to pay for abortions, but we don't have the money to pay for tax conformity for adoptions. And I think that's something that Minnesotans really disagree with. Sixteen states do have some form of an adoption credit at this point, but there are only a couple of states that are ranked in the top ten states for numbers of adoption that, are, that fall in this range. So why do you think Minnesota should join this minority of states, this minority number? Why should we be a part of that group? Well, there's a broad consensus across Minnesota society that adoption is a good thing, that we like it, we support it, and I think it's a responsible role of government to be promoting that and incentivizing it, not discouraging it. And so as this session moves forward, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do all of the federal tax conformity. Unfortunately, now under Minnesota law, people who've had their homes foreclosed on and they participate in a short sale, that's subject to state taxes now. We've had some business-to-business -business sales taxes, and hopefully we can get these items repealed and we can have a little bit more of a friendly tax code. I do want to ask, in your press release on this issue, it pointed to easing the burden of Minnesota taxpayers given the budget surplus. So as you look ahead to taxes you'd like to see rolled back, and you just mentioned a few, where does this fall on the priority list, in your opinion? In my opinion, this should be one of our top priorities. Again, we're talking about adoptions. We're literally, these decisions to adopt involve saving young boys and young girls' lives. And I think this is something that everyone can support and get behind. I'm very pro-life. I very much, uh, it's an important issue to me on a personal level. And I think as a society, we value life. For me, this is one of the top priorities of this session. We have the money laying around. We, you know, candidly, we should have conformed last year so this problem never happened. At the very minimum, let's just solve this problem so it doesn't happen to more families going forward. And so have you spoken with the House tax chair at all? I haven't talked to the tax chair, but historically she's been in favor of federal conformity. Um, there's some fighting within the D Democrat Party here. As everyone knows, the Democrats are in total control. So there's some divisions within their ranks, but I'm hoping they see the common sense of this proposal. Okay. Representative Pat Garofalo, thank you for taking some time to talk to us about this issue. We'll track it next session. My pleasure. Thank you.
Representative Steve Draskowski says some counties in Minnesota continue to promote alternative traffic diversion programs in lieu of a traffic ticket and that it's an illegal practice. We've identified corruption here and corruption exists when you aren't following the law and local governments are flaunting the law. It's time for the legislature to act and uh, what does a law mean if we're not enforcing what we have? Do we have, local units of government don't have the ability to make their own laws and that's what they're trying to do here. If they wanted to do this program the way they're doing it, they needed to come to the legislature in order to get that authorization. That's the way to do it. Instead, they're basically flaunting the legislature, the governor, and the people of Minnesota. Representative Draskowski sat down with us after the news conference to detail his proposal. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Julie. So let's begin with this news conference, kind of taking it a step further. Give me an example of what an illegal traffic diversion program is. Who does it and what exactly is it? Yeah, there are, there are a small number of counties and cities. Uh, I think right now there's less than 8% of, of the counties and a very small number of cities, too, that are doing this. Uh, kind of the, some of the police culture and, and county attorney culture in Minnesota has developed this over the last decade or so outside of Minnesota law. Um, but what they do, Julie, is uh, they, instead of, in lieu of giving you the regular uniform traffic citation that's required in in Chapter 169 of state law. Instead of doing that, they give you a, a brochure that says uh, instead of, you, you have the option, you can take the regular traffic citation and go through the court process, or you can take this other route, which is about, at least in the county I live in, it's $2 cheaper uh, than what the uniform traffic citation would be. Uh, and it doesn't go on your record, and, and the auto insurance folks never find out about it. Um, and in return for that, you have to go to this safe driving course and take a, a, a driver safety training from the local law enforcement folks. So that's how it works. Um, and that's how it, it's been designed anyway. All of the money from the safe driving pretrial diversion programs that are not legal um, go, has gone to and been kept by the local unit of government. Uh, which uh, they don't have authorization to keep either. So. so is that the impetus for your legislation then, which we'll get into in a minute, but is it more about the money or is it the fact that these governments are going and doing something independently? Yeah, it's really both. Um, I mean, they, they don't have the authority to do these programs. As you know, uh, state law gives authority to counties and cities in the state of Minnesota. They don't have any authority on their own and cannot be that cannot be developed on their own. Uh, instead, a statute has to offer them that authority. In this area, there's not been any authority, number one, for them to do pre-trial traffic diversion programs or to take the money from people and keep it or spend it. Um, as a matter of fact, some people are wondering about uh, a potential violation of the Constitution. It's Article uh, 11, Section 13, where uh, you use take money in, in the case, in this case that uh, was taken under the color of state law and then spent on something that you're not authorized to spend it on. So those are all questions yet to come, but um, the reality is it's not authorized in law and that's really where the, the hitch is. Interestingly enough, um, and I covered in the press conference this morning, in 2009, realizing there were several years at that point in time of these types of programs uh, going because some of them started as early as 2003. Uh, in 2009, the legislature passed into law and, and the governor signed uh, a bill, actually Representative Saylor in the House authored legislation. I co-authored it at the, at, the, at the request of actually my local sheriff um, to uh, extend a, uh, what we now call um, uh, traffic citation program, a local government traffic administrative citation program, uh, which operates somewhat similarly, but there has to be authorization put forward by the county board. Uh, there has, uh, the ticket can be no, or the, the charge, the fee can be no more than $60. 20 of the $60 has to go to the state, so the county gets to keep $40. Uh, and it's a, a limited number of violations that can, you know, that this can serve. So that's there, but, um, and I think a lot of these jurisdictions that are violating the law, at least the, their county attorneys and sheriffs are aware of it, but they haven't used it or uh, don't really bring it up to their folks. Of course, 
and in some counties it's 85 or 120 or 125 dollars that the local jurisdiction is keeping under the legal regime versus the 40 that they could keep if they did a, a similar legal program. So what would your bill do? quickly, just concisely. Yeah. Two things is it would say if, uh, first of all, we would, uh, these 36 jurisdictions around the state that the state auditor cited in November for operating legal programs, it would say you need to give that money that, that you took away from people without the authority in law to take it from them, you need to give that back to the people you took it from. Uh, our government violated their civil rights by uh, taking their property away from them without the authority in law to do so. So it would do that and then if they didn't do that, uh, we as state government would withhold twice as much of, uh, in, in LGA uh, over the amount of time that was required uh, in order for that to, to happen. So we hope that doesn't happen, but uh, we need to have serious uh, consequences for serious transgressions. The other thing it would do is this. It if one or more of the counties or cities did not shut down their program, it would revoke uh, the ability for local law enforcement to uh, enforce the law in their community. The state patrol would come in and enforce the law there while they went to school at the state patrol and learned how to follow the law. A question that came up repeatedly during the news conference essentially was if local law enforcement is on board with this, and many local governments are obviously as well, why not allow the legislature to grant them the authority to continue down this path and maybe take the state's percentage? Are you open to something like that? Yeah. Uh, well, I think, uh, I think that discussion will certainly happen in the House and the Senate. I know in the House, Representative Hillstrom is going to have um, some extended hearings in her committee. I assume uh, the Senate is as well. The reality is we had that same discussion in 2009, and the product we came up with was Section 169.999, the legal program that we have now that's not as rich for these folks as the getting the full boat, the $125, they only get $40. Uh, I don't know that they even tell their local people that this other one exists. Uh, so that's one reason. The other one, of course, is, is a money thing uh, for, for state government. If, if we allow uh, local jurisdictions to keep the full amount, that's going to be close to $100 million of biennium that state government is not going to receive from them. So. Um, the proponents of that idea, I would ask them, are they going to raise taxes in order to do that, or which programs are they going to cut? Um, that's the reality. My last question for you is, are you optimistic you can get a hearing on this proposal? I'm rather hopeful. I'm going to have that discussion with uh, Representatives Paymar and Hillstrom in the House, and uh, I think uh, that their uh, extension of, a, of an open approach to this is one that uh, is promising. So we will see, and uh, actually I hope to see if we can get some DFL um, uh, signatures on the bill as well. Okay, Representative Steve Draskowski, thank you for joining us. It's been a long time since we've had you on the <laughs> set. So thanks again for your time. Thank you, Julie. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. And that concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.